The following podcast is based on actual events in the movie Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. Only the names, locations and events have been changed. Find out more on that song from that movie. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Cannonball! <laughs> I was getting more of like a, like a, a louder, more enthusiastic cannonball than that. But okay. We're recording at an earlier time. My my room is right next to the neighbours. <laughs> Thank you for joining that song from that movie, The Journey for the Very Best and Worst of Movie Songs. I am your glass case of emotion host, Dietrich. And as always, we're joined by the man who gets his clothes from the toilet store, Alex. <laughs> Didn't realise the Salvation Army was having a sale. Yeah. <laughs> you said that so disappointedly. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a lot of sighing at how many uh, quotes we uh, recognise, I think, in this. Yeah, because 60% of the time, he works every time, Ben. It's very true, and I get away with it. I am part of the anti-work movement. I was going to say you made with a little bits of uh, panther inside you, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish. Not that kind of panther, though. Not sex panther. <laughs> <laughs> I am not illegal in 40-something states. <laughs> not yet, anyway. So what have you guys been watching this past fortnight? I have been watching The Sinner, yeah, because yeah. there's fourth oh, season. Right. I got bored of the third season, the second season was meh. This one's decent, but I know I'll get bored of it eventually, as I do with most things. <laughs> the third season wasn't very good, so it was kind of like... terrible. I gave up the third season, yeah. Yeah. Prickly pear. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, so we were like, mm, we'll go, we'll give it another go because season one was really good. Season two was like, mm. and then this one's just like, uh, yeah, it's kind of bothered. Yeah. I wish you could review like everything with that like uh, online article. Just first season, eh. second season, eh. fourth season, <laughs> third season. <"Ugh." laughs> You have described most Netflix shows, though. That, that's how, yeah. like, TikTok is going to go. It's going to get even shorter, and reviews <laughs> are going to be just murmurings because people can't even stomach six seconds. I feel that yeah. in a murmur, you can get you can get a lot of understanding of a film or TV show, though. Yeah, there's a lot of nuance there. Yeah, definitely. I did go to cinema again, but once again, it was toddler <gasps> cinema. I saw Superwoman and Zog, which, to be fair, <laughs> you, can, you can watch on iPlayer, but it's just something to do. Sounds like a David Lynch sort of thing. No, it was two. It was two separate. The the Julia Donaldson, you know Julia Donaldson, nope. Raya of nope. the Gruffalo. Uh, oh right, okay, know. yep, yep, yep. Parents, parents will know. She wrote a lot of famous books, children's books. The Gruffalo being the main one, but also Zog, and also Superworm, <laughs> and many others. So I watched that. Yeah, they were all right. They're really nicely animated, actually, but they are on iPlayer if uh, if you want to watch them for free. But I did watch the film uh, last night in Soho last week, which I enjoyed. Oh, is that any good? I don't watch it yet. Yeah, I would recommend watching it. Yeah, it's it's not what you expect it to be in a lot of ways, and it's like it's, it almost like defies genre. <laughs> it's like, what is this supposed to be? <laughs> but I would recommend it. Yeah, it's really it's uh, it's it's good. I thought you would have seen it then. Would it been Edgar Wright? I thought you'd been like straight at the cinema. I suppose COVID. Yeah, I've been. I think I've been. I think I've been pretty poor recently. I must say. Oh well, it's on. Well, no, it's not. I was gonna say it's on Amazon Prime. It's we, is, we is it rented it? You can rent it on Amazon Prime for like three pounds. I think it might be on Now TV soon. I don't know why, but even I'll spend, you know, like a rubbish meal deal or something like that, and I don't bat an eye, but the idea of spending like £2.50 to watch something I actually really want to watch <laughs> blows my mind. Like, how dare they? <laughs> well, I think it is going to be on the Now TV soon, because yeah, I've seen yeah, it advertised on Sky Cinema, so you could probably wait a few months. Mm, yeah, I won't. But when it comes out, watch it. It's really good. D. Other than the Olympics, obviously. Uh, I've watched two films this week, one of them being the film we're talking about today, and the other being Encanto. Oh, go on, go on. Is it good? Is it worth it? Is it worth the hype? Uh, I thought it it was... Uh, the songs were good. There you go. All right. <laughs> it, felt, it felt like every time a song started, the movie decided to get its mojo, but the rest of the time, it sort of felt like nothing much was really happening. It's like all the creative flair went into the songs, which mm. are good, and I can see why they've been nominated. Maybe we'll discuss that in a future episode. <gasps> Spoilers. Yes. Well, we will. Yeah, the actual film itself. I couldn't tell you what the main plot outside of just like there's a magic house. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'm you, solved. You could say it's encanted. <laughs> encanted. Yeah. I'm assuming it's encanted. Is that, where's it set? The film is it set in South uh, America? Colum- Colombia. Yeah. yeah, Colombia. 
So is Encanto Spanish for Enchanted? Uh, yeah, I, just, I, I assume they didn't want Seems. to have two franchises with the same name. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely worth, worth a watch, even if it is just for the songs and the song set pieces. But outside of those, it is 90 minutes for a reason. And you, you haven't been to see Jackass uh, 40? Oh my god, yeah, I forgot. Come on. Sorry, Where yeah, yeah. Me and my wife went to Go see on. it on Valentine's Day. Of course. And uh, it's definitely worth seeing. It's uh, living up to the hype. It's the highest rated Jackass film critically. Ooh. Much better than I anticipated, but I wonder if part of that is I was apprehensive going to see it, and when it turned out to be good, my brain then went, oh, that was great. Ah, see. Brains do trickles like that. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Damn yeah. brains. <laughs> But um, all the new people <laughs> were good. I don't know if they would be able to carry it on their own, but they all added their own thing. And I'm intrigued to see where it goes next, because I was re- listening to an interview and uh, Jordan Knoxville played down the idea that this is the last film. Ooh. Well, well, I guess, that, that scares me. I guess like a future one, so he can just like stand there and, and do his laugh guy, really. I mean, that's what he does yeah, for yeah, most yeah, of the yeah, film yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> just, be a di- just be a director on set. Probably won't do any like the larger stunts anymore. He'd probably more like a almost like a master of ceremonies kind of yeah, role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bez role, the hype man. <laughs> Just like yeah, the Bez role. Yeah. Can you imagine Bez on Jackass? <laughs> no, I mean he's on Dancing on Ice at the moment, isn't he? <laughs> it's about essentially the same thing. <laughs> 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 I've, I've just just before we go on, have you guys ever seen that thing where the Happy Mondays go to like that like African tribe and like do a performance for them? No. <laughs> Watch no. it on YouTube. It is amazing. Oh, wow. It's like one of the best God. TV clips of all time. The guy, the the people in like the tribe are just like so confused. <laughs> they don't know whether they're supposed to. <laughs> I, I would be confused. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like they're doing like a trade of of the best music of like the Western world, and it's the Happy Monday. <laughs> is, is that all we've got? <laughs> It's like if there's an alien invasion and we needed one band to save our lives and somehow it ended up being the Happy Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> right, should we move on? Yeah, move on. Okay, so this week we are breaking down Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and specifically the song Afternoon Delight. So to find out what was happening in the world when the movie came out. Time for some history. Yep. And it's the recent history. So we're going back to September 2004. Now this... Ooh is a seminal month for the three of us, individually. Shall I tell you why? Yeah, go for it. D. Yeah? J.J. Abrams' lost premieres in the US on ABC <laughs> to critical acclaim changes your life forever. It, it does, yeah. And your yeah. and your physical appearance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Alex, Green Day release American Idiot. Oh, uh, wow. Well. <laughs> big album. Big album. <laughs> big album in the Alex household. And for me, teen noir TV show Veronica Mars premieres. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that a big were you a big Veronica Mars fan? Secretly, I never told you guys. I never told you. I was scared of the criticism. It's a good show though. <laughs> yep. The the kind of person I was before. It's Veronica Mars, you just don't want to know. <laughs> what a time to be alive. You remember that shift in me, Alex, at thirteen. You just was like, "Well, Ben's Ben's a different." <laughs> yeah, but I, I I just put it down to hormones. I, I, all... <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, that, like that that was involved. That was definitely. Involved. Don't go into any more detail, please. <sighs> No, I definitely won't, definitely won't. But thank you, Veronica, uh, and the others. <laughs> but yes, September 2004 also saw the release of the mega-hit US satirical comedy Anchorman, colon, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. Respect the colon. Uh, direct. <laughs> Bran. <laughs> good point, good point. Directed by Adam McKay, starring the likes of Will Ferrell in the titular role, as well as Christina Applegate, Paul Rudd, Steve Carell, and many more. For the unaware, the film follows a 70s San Diego newsroom as a male-dominated group attempts to come to terms with a new female anchor. We've all seen this. Most people have seen this. But where do we stand? I mean, obviously, this film means a lot to us as a group. (laughs) I think we've probably seen it about a thousand billion times. I mean, you say it's like it was hugely successful. I'd be interested to know how well it did at the cinema because in my head, this film is only successful because of the resulting DVD release and uh, teenage sleepover parties that happened between the years 2005 and 2009. <laughs> That's probably where this film <laughs> made its name, I should think, for people who probably were too young to watch it. Um, yeah, I haven't rewatched it probably for about 10 years now. It's been really, really long time. Ever since the fiasco of Anchorman 2, probably, <laughs> was when I was like, no, I'm, I'm over. I'm over Anchorman. Yeah. I very much enjoyed it back in the day. It's very quotable. As everyone who you've ever met 
of a certain age will tell you over and over by telling you the quotes. So yeah, yeah, that's like that sounds like that tr- that weird sort of a belief that once you stop taking drugs, oh, you just do it one more time, just just rinse yourself of it, and you don't enjoy it. And you're like, yeah, I never need drugs again. <laughs> so Anchorman Two just rinsed you. It's like you and Veronica Mars. Yeah, well, no, no, I go back to that. Oh, no, we... I meant when they brought it back. Oh no, wait, wait, we don't talk. We don't talk about the film. We don't talk about the film. <laughs> I was going to mention that. Maybe. We don't talk about the film in the uh, in in the in the Mars verse. Well, I, f- I feel like we're, to go back to Anchorman. I feel <laughs> to move away from Ben's weird weird obsession with Veronica Mars. Um, yeah, I feel like I was very much one of those people who you would meet, and I would quote Anchorman to you. But then I became after Anchorman to you, I became one of those people. Who's like, oh, why do people keep quoting Anchorman at me? That's that's my relationship to the to the franchise. Yeah. In group to out group in one film. Yeah. What about you, do? Yeah, I'm sort of similar. I, I rewatched it this week, and I have been sort of mentally preparing what I'm going to say for this segment, and not really knowing what exactly my stance is on the film now. When I watched it the other night, I had sort of like a lukewarm reaction to it. I never found myself laughing out loud, but more sort of mentally acknowledging that there was a joke and the joke was funny. But never laughing out loud. It was like that bit in uh, Scrubs with JD's girlfriend, who would only ever say "That's so funny." She would never actually laugh. <laughs> That's oh, so right, yeah, funny. yeah, 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 she... yeah. Never says "That's so sad." Though. <laughs> She's actually crying. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I, I definitely wouldn't say Anchorman is so funny like she would. More of a kind sort of like a sharp exhale out of my nose. So Mark Commode always says it's the six laugh test to see if a comedy is good. You have to laugh six times. Did you laugh six times? then Jackass River is a Best Picture nominee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so when we watched it, it made me think back to the first time I saw it, and I then realised I actually saw this at the cinema. Okay. And I actually remember being a bit lukewarm to it then as well. All these memories came flooding back, like the bit with Jack Black, where he kicks the dog. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. thinking that was like incredibly hilarious, like maybe the funniest part of the entire film, and telling people about it to the point where I remember downloading it on um, a very legal... Uh, Music and video sharing service. Lime wire. <laughs> Napster. A what? A what wire? Don't know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> to show people. It wasn't until later that the quote sort of dawned on me that they were funny too. <laughs> it was like the slapstick humour. Love it. But the quotes didn't mean anything to me. So it didn't actually make that much of a lasting impression. It was only similar to what Alex said, like years later when it was available on DVD and you'd hear it every single day you went to school. That I was like, I'll give it another go, and I'll now look for for actual jokes, not just a dog being kicked. <laughs> it maybe one of those things where now I've watched it back again. I know all the quotes off the top of my head, so it's lost its impact. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like a song, isn't it? In a lot of ways, that like y- you listen to a song first, and like mm, yeah, I wasn't that bothered that, but then you hear it like a thousand times, and it's like, yes, I like this song now. And that's the same like this kind of film. It's like you hear the joke so often that you become part of something else, and that's what makes it funny. Because mm-hmm. like yeah, on the yeah. on the road, because I was like looking at the quotes earlier, and I was like, yeah, I remember these quotes, but they're not funny when you read them on a piece of paper. It's more, I suppose, yeah, it's the fact that people just repeated them over and over and over again that they just became entrenched in your mind as funny, whether they're actually funny or not. I don't know. Was this the most quoted film of our adolescence? Oh, probably. They saw airplane. Yeah. Gold member. <laughs> yeah, also that. Well, that, that was South highly Park. quoted, but not many lines. Yeah, it's just the same ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thoughts milk cabbage. <laughs> There's things like that, though. To be fair, I watched that. I watched Golden Boot the other day when that came on. It still okay, came I watched Golden Boot the other day as well, and I was laughing but thinking, oh, should I be laughing at this? <laughs> I think it's because it just doesn't make sense. Anyway, yeah, I have the exact same feeling. I think it's a pretty good film, but I watched it back this week. Because you know everything when it's about to mm. happen. Like I've I've retold it's like retelling a story so often that when it's retold to you you're like well I already know it <laughs> so I'm not get I'm just not getting the same buzz from it yeah. um it almost existed better just in my mind because I found the quotes so well they just come to the fore of your brain in so many situations I'm in a glass case of emotion is something that's so easy to say for like it can be applied to so many situations but when you see it in the film I don't know it just it's lost its weight. But I don't feel like that's the same with some other films, like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which I feel is also very quotable. But I can still enjoy that a lot. Just can't, something about this film I just can't grasp to it anymore. Anchorman, at the time, was met to both critical and commercial acclaim. Its stock has fallen slightly since. So the film made $28.4 million in its opening weekend in the US, and $90.6 million worldwide in its theatrical run, which is pretty good for a comedy that wasn't really expected at the time to do much. Like, I think this was 
quite early in the Will Ferrell explosion. But at the time, or in the few years afterwards, Time Out put it as number six on the greatest 100 comedies of all time. Hmm. Six. Hmm. No. Which is... No. Yeah, and (laughs) Empire put it at 113 of the greatest 500 movies of all time. (laughs) But this is the thing. I think this film exists very highly in people's memories. Yeah. But when you watch it, it's not as funny. It's it's a weird like it's it's had a a life of its own in your brain. I think partly because it is so quotable, they're like standout lines. They're almost set up like a uh, stand up show. Yeah. But yes, you look at lists in recent years. Like I've looked at a few on uh, there's one on Entertainment Weekly, one in the Guardian. It's still lingering on lists of like top hundred co- uh, top hundred comedies, like Ron Burgundy top character lists. <laughs> but it keeps moving down. Like, the later on, and I know films generally come out, but it's not, that doesn't seem to be playing a part. It's slowly degrading in people's memories, as opposed to films like, you know, Holy Grail, Life of Brian, um, Airplane, Naked Gun still has quite a big following. Uh, Some Like It Hot is still considered the greatest comedy on a lot of these lists. It doesn't seem to have that effect, and I wonder if that's those kind of, like, very laddish films that came out in, like, the early noughties, in, like, old school... Wedding Crashers, you know, th- films like that, that was very, well, you know, it's a lot of fart jokes, a lot of um, poi humour. I don't know if that's it. It's just all the uh, the frat pack films of that time, isn't it? That don't seem to be ageing very well. But like, do you think American Pie does? The first one does. Oh, is that, yeah, is that kind of, because it's kind of like a coming of age sort of... I think that's removed enough comedy. from that sort of group of SNL actors. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah, yeah, the, the Adam Sandler sort of films. Yeah. Yeah, I think American Pie as well is like really targeted at a specific audience. So it's kind of mm-hmm. because of that, it has more almost like more lasting power because people find it at that age and watch it even like now, yeah. probably either. Yeah, even yeah. though like yeah. obviously there's like we've discussed it when we did the episode, like there's a lot of inappropriate stuff in there, maybe isn't for today's audience, but I think probably it's still found. I think like with this, it's like it's it's sort of generic in that it's there for everybody. Yeah, it, I'm not surprised it doesn't have like the lasting power of something like airplane or, or monty python because they're just like they're just f- actually fun i don't know how best to describe it but they're actually <laughs> funny whereas this feels of its time even even though it's set in yeah. the 70s obviously it feels of like it's of the mid noise and it's like all the all the jokes are tailored towards that and the people that are in it as well like the cameos and stuff like vince vaughn and uh luke wilson and stuff it's like it's very yeah. mid noise the experience of watching the film was basically 90 odd mates of me going is that Catherine hahn uh is that seth rogan is that it's yeah, 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 yeah. Like every role had there. someone in it who is now a bigger name for something else and would never be a background actor. It was a very odd experience. Like um, the guy that does Jerry's voice in Rick and Morty, Chris Chris Parnell. Every time he spoke, all I could hear was Jerry. If you worked in SNL at some point in your life, you had a career, it seemed. Yeah. Uh, especially if you were a white middle class male. McKay and Ferrell started working on this on Saturday Night Live. The script was originally called August Blowout, and they described it as Glen Gary Glen Ross in a car dealership. That does not sound like the comedy <laughs> that I think. But listen to this, what was in it originally. And I want to know if this would have improved or <laughs> made the experience worse. So the film went through several iterations. One, where it was based on the disaster film Alive. Do we know that film? No. Nope. Is that the one where people eat themselves? Basically, yeah. It's like a, a, a rugby team crashes in the Alps and they have to like survive. So more more akin to like airplane and naked gun spoofs, um. But part of the original script involved Ron Burgundy fighting weapon wielding orangutans and a musical number involving sharks. <laughs> that sounds like a Jim Carrey film in my head. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I can see how they got from there to Anchorman, definitely. Yeah, well, like I say, and then it, <laughs> the script evolved again. So once they got closer to the final version, it was reshot heavily because they made a version it tested poorly with test audiences, and because of that, originally, Ron and the team followed a group of hippie bank robbers called the Alarm Clock, but they swapped it for a less distracting story about a local panda. So I think the narrative was a lot more, I guess, clean, rather than, oh, it's lots of, it's kind of skits of just uh, Ron upset that there's a, a woman anchor. But that footage, and I don't know if you're aware of this, went on to like a straight-to-DVD minifilm oh, called is Wake the... Up Ron Burgundy, the lost movie. Yeah, I was going to ask, what what is that? Because I saw it when I was looking on Wikipedia to see when this came out. I was like, was there three films? So I had this, but I don't remember it. Basically, they made a film. People didn't like it. 
So they reshot loads of the film. That became Anchorman. And the things they got rid of, they just put it together and released it after the success of the film to just make some, you know, more moolah. Right, okay. Um, And it worked clearly because my parents bought me it. Ron Burgundy did become a lovable character. He has been used in various sketches. Uh, Will Ferrell pulls him out of his pocket every so often when he wants to make a quick book. Empire voted him 26th in the 100 greatest movie characters. And Will Ferrell says, it's the best character I've ever played. It made him a name, I would say so. I think so. Yeah, definitely. I can't remember when Elf came out. Was that around this time? Um... Ooh, good point. It probably is around this time. I mean, I think obviously his great role is Mugatu in Zoolander, but we won't get into that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I created yeah. the piano key necktie! <laughs> That's quite a good uh, impression, Alex. For you. Thanks. But <laughs> many reviews basically focused on how it made infantile humour clever, witty, and quotable. So the quotable thing seems to be taken even by critics. There was something very easily applied to day-to-day life with this film. What was also praised was the ability for the film to sit quite humorously in 70s San Diego, even though the film was filmed in Los Angeles. One of those scenes involves the news team coming together to sing an a cappella version of the song Afternoon Delight. Before we talk about the role for this song in the film, I'm going to give you a bit of a brief history on it, because it is by a band. I don't know if you've seen the video for this song, but my (laughs) god, they are 70s. Oh, I haven't. So the song Afternoon Delight was released by the Starland vocal band in April 1976 by Windsong Records. Give me your thoughts on this song. Just Have you heard of it aside from the Anchorman version? I actually don't know anymore. I feel like when, when (laughs) when I saw the film... What is life? I knew the song already, but I don't know where from. Okay, okay. But now I only associate with this film. Is there any chance that you remember the song from the episode of Complete Savages, where they kept playing it to disperse teenagers? (laughs) D, there's a very good chance that that's where I know it from. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly, that's why I thought I'd jump in and say. It probably is that, and that's probably why why it was in my mind when I saw the film. Because I guess Complete Savages was before this, wasn't it? That would have been like 2002, maybe? Oh, maybe it's it's, yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. There's a good chance that that's actually yeah. why I already knew it. <laughs> I mean, I I did know of the song before the film. I, I knew what they, what they were singing. When I think of Starline Vocal Band, all I think about is Homer's tattoo on The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. That was a joke that I had seen, never understood it, and only when reading it back I was like, oh, okay, that's what he's referencing. Because that is not a good name for a group. <laughs> if you're a band, why do you call yourself the Starland Vocal Band? <laughs> Just call yourself Starland. <laughs> Yeah, it had to be a part of a creative direction. It has a title with too many words in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, not, it's not pulling that very very <laughs> loose thread. Um, Dee, have you got your phone with you? Yes. Type it in, the music video, and give us just a very, very brief play-by-play. Mainly the first 20 seconds, as soon as you cop eyes. And I want you mostly to focus on a particular <laughs> gentleman up front singing called Bill Danoff. <laughs> Because, my God, if he's not on an FBI Most Wanted list, I would not know. <laughs> oh, bless him. Okay, well, the thumbnail looks like something oh, from, like, a cult. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very, uh, my, Charles Manson. Yeah, Charles Manson. Charles Manson. Yeah. But, it, but as well, like, there's, like, one person's, like, upside down, and then there's a... It's, like, I don't understand what's going on at the very beginning. There's, like, there's like legs, <laughs> but some of them's upside down. So okay, okay, I, I'm starting now. It sort of looks like... The... <laughs> well, okay, great start. Um, is it just... Ugh. It's li- <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's this Tom Jones looking motherfucker? <laughs> oh yeah, who's that guy? Well. <laughs> so it's a group of four, two men and two women, I think. Like Abba. Um, yeah, 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 like Abba. <laughs> yes, very much like Abba. There's not much to the video other than these guys serenading <laughs> off, not even to camera, just off. It does look very Abba in terms of like the way they're sort of singing away from camera oh, yeah, or a bit yeah. books fizz. It might have been, I don't know, was it pre-ABBA? I don't know when ABBA no, came about. No, did you say it was 1976? Yes. That's like that's like high of ABBA. High of ABBA. <laughs> okay, good thing we've got our, uh, <laughs> we've got our ABBA Cause, anthology. Because there is, there's like the parts where they're singing like face to face. That is so cringe in this, that it's awful. And then like, yeah, there's like fireworks that keep appearing in the background. Yeah. Like they've kind of merged them in, like overlay it, layered them. It's, it's, all, it's just terrible. But yeah, so watchable. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing you were referring to the guy with the glasses, Ben. <laughs> uh, mostly the guy with the glasses, yes. The visionary behind this song. So yes, the song 
Afternoon Delight was written by Bill Danoff, the gentleman, beautiful gentleman you've seen before. Sorry, Bill. He also famously had writing credits on John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads. Yeah, that makes sense. That checks. <laughs> <laughs> that checks, that checks, yeah. So the group supported John Denver later that year. Yeah, yeah, they were yeah. quite close. Yeah, John Denver, also creepy looking. <laughs> <laughs> also creepy looking, yeah. But, it, it, you know, it's nice to... Uh, it's one of those things I was reading about. It. It's become like the uh, sort of West Virginia anthem. Um, but I was reading about it and he says like he's never been to West Virginia before in his life before that he was just thinking of places that kind of fit you know the uh, the bars yeah. like he was almost going to do Massachusetts <laughs> Matt <Mama. laughs> so that was the, apparently that was the other option <laughs> um, but anyway yes John said the title for this song came from happy hour menu at Clyde's restaurant in Georgetown Washington DC and said in an interview with the Washington Post he was with his friend Mary Chapman, and it was after lunch, and from three to six, they had these table tents out, and it said, Afternoon Delights. It was a little menu of like four items, and I thought it would be a neat title for a song. His then-wife at the time, Taffy Nivert, who was also in Starland Vocal Band, in the interview said, I was at hospital having an operation for cervical cancer. Bill came and said, I'm starting another song. <laughs> so while he was out with his other woman, <laughs> having a nice time. She was uh, yeah, a bit more busy, but he came, wrote this song, and he said he didn't want to write an all-out sex song. Uh, I just wanted to write something that was fun and hinted at sex. <laughs> it's quite opaquely about sex. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, well, this is what I think, but I've, I've heard people, like Adam McKay talking about this song, and he said, when you listen to it as a kid, and he said it was on the radio everywhere, it was one of those, like earworm songs one of those songs that eventually you know you just hated it because it was on like every hour um you just didn't know but like i remember like as a kid listening to that bloody song was it i want to have sex on the beach yeah. and i wasn't thinking about sex <laughs> <laughs> i assure you parents i was about a drink uh yeah it might have been but that's the way they get around it um but yeah do you think how subtle do you think it is <laughs> i mean after seeing the video not so at all <laughs> There's so much sexual tension in that video. Now, there's one line that he said wasn't an innuendo, which clearly it is. <laughs> which one do you think it might uh, be? Rubbing sticks and stones together make the sparks ignite. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that wasn't that. Yeah, that one is that like, that's sexual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's pure, pure, pure unadulterated. Um, I don't have no idea. Sky rockets in flight. Boom! <laughs> we'll go on to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Not that bit. <laughs> But yes, he said he he think he got skyrockets in flight from a comic. I don't think you did, Paul. <laughs> I mean, is there anything more more suggestive than a rocket launching? <laughs> Literally, that's what I mean. It, it's is. in that isn't that Naked Gun uh, scene? You know that comes after the ghost bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to go back to Austin Powers, there's even that whole section about that smooth long ship that looks like some guys. <laughs> yeah, Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> At the time of writing. That little bit I've just talked about. The group didn't exist. There was no Starland vocal band and how we existed, I do not know. I can't believe But that. Danoff knew he wanted a group harmonic sound for the song. Mm -hmm. So he recruited John Carroll and Margot Chapman. Lovely name. Some great names in this band. Great names, isn't it? Yeah. They were going Instead for the actual name of the band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. They were going for something akin to the Mamas and the Papas. <laughs> they didn't quite hit that level, did they? <laughs> <laughs> no, they did not. Now, the song, as I hinted to, was very successful at the time. Radio presenters said there wasn't anything out there at the time quite like it, mainly because disco had exploded. So this was definitely not disco. <laughs> So I think it basically allowed most radio stations to cover the bases. It was number one for two weeks in the US, and it charted top tens in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, among many others. At the Grammys, the 19th Grammys, can we imagine how many awards and nominations this got? Because the Grammys are absolutely stupid. Um, lots. Well, ten. Yeah. Well, no, it didn't actually. It got three, yeah, okay. which maybe which, says something about it. Which is probably too much for this. So. It, won, <laughs> it won the Grammy for best arrangement for voices. Yep. <laughs> yep. Sure. Like, like most songs. Okay. Yeah, and exactly what the hell are you on about Grammys? And was also nominated for best pop performance by a duo or group 
with vocals, yeah. with vocals, yeah, keep going. Uh, because there's because there's a <laughs> best pop performance by a duo or a group without vocals. Yeah. So I don't know what that duo are doing. <laughs> it was <laughs> just like patty cake or something. I don't know. And then song of the year. I was nominated for song of the year. That's pretty good. Lost out to something I've never even heard of. So I'm not even really down. Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I thought, ooh, that'll be interesting. What did it lose to? Not a clue. Not a clue. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty big song. Eventually, though, it suffered the success of any one hit wonder. Eventually, people started to hate it. Uh, and it was known as a punching bag song. Like it was the song that you'd turn the radio off for. <laughs> now, how much do you think a group like this made <laughs> for Afternoon Delight? I'm guessing not much. In the <laughs> 70s. Think of the think of the the success. It got a lot of airtime, maybe for a year plus. Is it one of those weird things where they don't own the music? <laughs> yeah, like you had said that they sold it all for like a, a cheese grill sandwich or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was not that much. I wish it was that. It would have made a better story. So they earned $66,000. Okay, well, okay. that sounds like a lot in the 70s. $66,000, yes. That's all they ever made <laughs> for anything. They never had any royalties. They've never seen any more money for the song since. That's how much they got to write the track. They split it between four, and that's all they saw. Any other iterations of the song, I'm pretty sure, doesn't go to them. Most likely goes to Wind Song Records. Um, it was it had various sort of iterations in the 90s, but most famously it was used when we come to Adam McKay and Anchorman. So Adam McKay said, while making the film, we were on set, and Paul Rudd and Will started talking about rehearsing Afternoon Delight with Steve Carell and David Kirchner? Sure. Uh, ben, I believe it's pronounced David Kechner, as uh, Je- Kechner? Jenna Fisher on uh, the Office Ladies <laughs> podcast would say. The Office Ladies. Okay, Kechner. Ke- Kechner. Ken Quapis. <laughs> Ken Quapis. <laughs> they thought it would be a great thing to sing on talk shows and in other promotional appearances. I said, forget that. I'm going to have you do it in the movie. I know the perfect scene where Ron is revealing to the guys that he's in love with Veronica Corningstone. <laughs> so we brought in a music coach to work with them on the harmonies, and I just assumed they'd been working on it. Turns out they'd only done it once. Will flat out told me, we can't do this, we're not ready. <laughs> but the first take they did, they were amazing. The crew applauded, and we were done. It's a one take. It's a one take. It's a one take. It's a one take. Whoa! Take. It's good that in it, yeah. Because when you watch it back, like you watch that scene back, which we're going to go on to talk about now, it's done really well. Yeah, it's incredible. I think the um, the cuts, the, some of the cuts, um, I think are redone, but generally, yeah, the main footage of them is the first take. That that makes it more impressive. Like in my head, I thought it was like seven or eight takes put together, but the fact that they just did it once and yeah. essentially called it a day is how good is that? Wow. So yeah, the, obviously the scene we mentioned, it's where there's an a cappella version where the group of four sing this. Um, Will Ferrell, Steve Carell, Paul Rudd, and David Keckner. Yeah. <laughs> what do we think of this scene then? Given the songs, uh, the, not the songs used in the movie, the the cover, it, it did feel like an odd choice for this podcast, I suppose, in that sense. But I think it qualifies. When I think of the song in its own right, I don't really think of the Starline vocal band version. I think of this version from Anchorman. <laughs> If I hear the song in my head, I hear the four guys' harmony, one take harmony, apparently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and more specifically, the bit where Alex has done before, where Champ does the boop bit. Uh, so so it's definitely a song from that movie, in, that, in my eyes. Uh, it's just a, a, an amazing performance, made even better by what you've just told us. And it's uh, far more pleasing than that uh, uh, cr- crusty old original. But, you know, when in Rome. When in Rome, yeah, when in Rome. <laughs> Do as the Romans do. I've never heard that expression. <laughs> Quite beautiful. <though. laughs> See, that's the thing. The quotes are great, but there's some reason. I think you almost... Anch- to be fair, we'll go back now. I think if you watch Anchorman in a group, I think it's still, it's still land. Yeah. Because she, it's that shared yeah. experience again. Agreed. I think it's one of those films, like, you know, like you can enjoy a bad movie with loads of people. In a way, it's almost in- more enjoyable than most summer blockbusters. But... You need to have a shared experience with it. But I almost feel like uh, it's one of those films where I've probably only seen it by myself like once. <laughs> it's always been with a group of people, you generally. But yeah, yeah. Alex, thoughts? Uh, very much the same as as, as D. Like at, at first, I thought, oh, it's kind of an odd choice because it's not really. It's like it's just a, a bit in the film, isn't it? It's not like it's a a song that's been like 
chosen to promote the film or is like does fit the bill because you think of the song and you think of the film the two are kind of inextricably linked they just you can't separate the two of them and the film makes the song as well because like a whole generation of people would not have cared less about the song <laughs> if it had not been in this film yeah yeah for that reason it for that reason it's i mean but no it's um yeah it's uh it, you'll give it, stalin vocal yeah, band sixty six thousand pounds <laughs> for 20 percent of this song 20 percent of the stake of their bit song <laughs> yeah i don't think i knew this song before this film um, and I don't think I knew it that well afterwards either, to be honest. No, just a bit. <laughs> yeah, mainly the boo, boo, mostly. No, that kind of resonated more with my 13-year-old um, vernacular and ability to remember things. But yeah, John Carroll of the Starland Vocal Band said that's how he knows where people know the song from, <laughs> Whether they're depending on whether they do the boo part. <laughs> and apparently... It's, that's written in the interview, so I hope he did that in the interview with the Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's written in text. How many E's and O's when he when the guy in the Washington Post wrote, Boo! <laughs> God. Well, presumably a B at the beginning. Um, yeah. Um... One E, and then lots of W's? No, nah, three, three E's, four O's, uh, three W's. Uh, I want to put an O in it. You want to put a no in it? Just no. boo. B E W. Bell. Bell. Uh, anyway, that's the level we're going for. Uh, but Alex, you, you, you got something. You got something wrong in what you said, Alex. This song was used to promote the film because they released the music video for it. Oh, fair enough. Like an actual made music video, not using scenes from the film. It's not the style and vocal band version. It's the a cappella version in full. I've never seen that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's pretty poor because their actual quality of the song is poor. <laughs> I don't know if it was released as a thing. I think it was just released as a promotional material. But yeah, they're like going for a picnic. Um, Christina Applegate's there very, almost like a mannequin that they're just moving around, basically. Um, it's it's not great. <laughs> it's not great. It adds nothing. But I imagine, like I say, everyone wanted more Anchorman after the film came out. And I think this is kind of how they gave them it. It was made for the YouTube generation. Well, yeah, no, definitely. And off that point, Adam McKay said that about a year after Anchorman, he started to see tons of internet videos of guys dressed up like the news team singing Afternoon Delight. I don't really remember this. Uh, and I'm pretty finger on the pulse of May Mays. Um He just weren't invited, Ben. <laughs> just wasn't invited, no, no. It was hilarious yeah. when Alex d- uh, dressed up as champ. <laughs> it wasn't. I was, I, was always, I was always the fifth person in our group. <laughs> the one holding the camera. Yeah, apparently they were everywhere. Uh, and when the group, they did the Funny or Die tour, which I think was like an SNL tour. Oh, yeah. There were college students coming to shows dressed as the news team singing Afternoon Delight. So it clearly resonated and had kind of a at least a small cultural impact. Might have been, you know, if it was slightly later to this film, I don't know if the film might have been as successful, but it might have blown up a lot more on the internet then if it has something that can be sort of canned uh, and canonized into the uh, stratosphere of the internet, you know, and just kind of replayed and rehashed and redone. Um, a lot of films try and do that now subtly we've talked about before like most songs in movies now are just kind of like afterthoughts to kind of drill up more promotion and yeah. kind of awareness so yeah i think they could have you know that probably wasn't their atten- intention well actually no sorry it was their intention but i think it would have had a lot more of an impact yeah i, I, I feel like if it came out nowadays you'd have like videos of tiktoks and reels on instagram where it's like the worst places to sing afternoon delight and it's like yeah people yeah, yeah. like a funeral well, that really terrible green screen app. I think you've just started something, Dave. I have not yet been on TikTok. I am still slightly confused and scared by it in my old age. Those TikTokers with their Minecraft. With their, yeah, with yeah, with their Minecraft and their Scrobbles. Always twitching. <laughs> Always twitching. No cap. You d- there is, when I have seen them come up on things like YouTube, I think does it on Instagram, there is like f- like four or five songs that just seem to get over like every video that just can- seem to get absorbed into the zeitgeist. You hear them played on the radio and I'm like, oh, that's that thing that I keep seeing on the internet. It's almost like a reverse of what I feel should happen. Afternoon Delight could have been that, mainly because of the very overt sexual overtones. <laughs> because yes, it's it's you're slapping us in the face with it. Top five. Top five time. So, scoured the internet, as I always do. Since we've mostly talked about this film being the most quotable film of all time, E! Entertainment did a public poll of what is the greatest Anchorman quote. 
And it's got quite a lot of responses, including mine. I could still vote. It's never closed, the voting. <laughs> Are you saying we could, like, throw it? Uh, well, I mean, I say I've, I I could throw it. There's thousands upon thousands of votes. Oh, right, okay. So, yeah, there's quite a lot. But I'm wanting to know, what are the top five? And I don't want you to just throw every Anchorman quote at me. I want you to think about this. Okay. So I want you to have a consult between the two of you, come up with the top five, and then we'll see how many you get. Okay. Well, okay. I mean, I think for me, Whale's Vagina will probably have been in there. <laughs> People are always yeah. saying Wales vagina. Yeah, definitely. I think um, the period attracts bears will be up there. <laughs> they can smell the menstruation. Um, I did. Ben already did the glass case of emotion, or someone did it already. That could be in there. Yeah, um, and e- equally, um, mi- or milk was mi- a bad milk choice. was a bad choice. Feels like a quote that it's it's small and snappy enough for people to go. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that one click. Yeah. <laughs> D's are D's on the modern generation. He's got the finger on the pulse. <laughs> I think what we need to try to figure out is. What are people? What, what do we think that people are voting this on? Like, what? what That's are... what I'm thinking more of because none of those are really my favorite quotes. Yeah, like, are people go, like would stay close I... to San Diego? Be oh yeah. In... Oh, would it be like, oh, go fuck, fuck you, yourself. San Diego? Yeah, go fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah. San Diego. Of course. Also, I love Lamp. I mean, that. Would oh be yeah, uh, that that might have been number one. I think I would put that a strong contender for number one. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what Go we're on yelling then. Make, about. Make a, make a note. Make a note. Make a note. Make a note. You get. You're having a lot of good thoughts here. Yeah. So I think I I love lamp. I think, like you yep. said, there'll be like either go fuck yourself, San Diego, or stay classy, San Diego. One of those two will be in it. I feel like we can group those together, Ben. And one of them, one of them might be in it. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Milk was a bad choice, or what were the other ones we said? Glass case of emotion. One of those two, probably. Yeah. Or I can't believe you ate a whole wheel of cheese. Sorry, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Um, See, it is very quotable. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Wales Vagina. Wales Vagina will be in the list. The Sex Panther line will be definitely in that top five. Oh, of course. hundred yeah, percent that is that is there. Or sixty percent it'll be there. <laughs> well, it'll be there every Go time. On, write down five. <laughs> write down five. Or okay, so I, I love lamp. Yep, number one. I love lamp. The, stay stay classy or go fuck yourself, San Diego. I don't know if you want to pick one of yep. those two D, but it'll be one of okay. one of those. Uh okay. group em. Yeah, the Sex Panther line about yep. works no, the third. Time. Yep. Um Whale's vagina, I think, will be in there. Yeah. Personally. And then, and then no more. Glass no case more. of emotion or, or the milk one, one of those two. They're both kind of the same line, aren't they? But it's the same scene as well, isn't it? Yeah. G- 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 yeah, we'll go with glass case of emotion then. I think yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go, go for that. Yeah, yeah go lock it in. in. Final answer. Locked in. We need a locked in sound. Um, the the lights you. have just gone down as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the lights have gone down. Four out of five. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Four out of five. Not, not doing bad. Not doing bad. Uh, number one, with 17.2% of the vote, is they've done studies, you know, 60% of the time. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Second is I'm in a glass case of emotion. Okay. With 16.3% of the vote. Third, I'm going to punch you in the ovary. That's what <laughs> I'm going to do. <laughs> really? <laughs> Apparently so. Uh, fourth, I love lamp. Uh, and fifth was, technically I gave it, but it's that you stay classy San Diego. I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> Ron Burgundy. I'm assuming so, but the fact that there's a question mark at the end. I'm, assu- I'm, I'm surprised the Wales Vagina wasn't one in there, because that's what everyone was always yeah, saying. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, no, it's seventh. Oh, right. Okay. After I'm very important, I have many leather-bound books. <laughs> many leather-bound books. <laughs> I think we did well there. Yeah, you did. you did pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Honorable mentions. You don't think you mentioned the uh, where did you get those clothes at the toilet the store? store yeah. By the beard of Zeus. <laughs> I think we need, what we need to know is what's last. Uh, what's last? Um, the lowest one seems to be it's anchor man, not anchor lady, and that's a scientific that's fact. fact. <laughs> yeah, that one. Or oh, great knights of Columbus that hurt. They're the lowest rated one. Aqualung was that? Zero point seven. No, no one seems to have voted for that one. So now it's time to do a uh, movie or song, but actually do it this time, not movie or 1917, like we did last week. <laughs> so, Alex, what is better, <laughs> the song Afternoon Delight performed by the cast of Anchorman, or the movie Anchorman performed by the cast of Anchorman? Yeah. <laughs> I think I probably still will have to say film, because even though I like this, I think the scene where they sing the song is probably one of the highlights of the film. And it's one of the scenes that most people will remember. The film, it's still, I think the reason, probably part of the reason I didn't rewatch it was because I didn't want to ruin the idea of the film that I had. And so because I didn't rewatch it, I, I still kind of have that in my mind. And I have a lot of nostalgia for this film, even though I don't think it's probably as good as I once did. 
I can still keep it in that nice yeah. box in the back of my mind. That's a, yeah, I remember. I had yeah, a lot of good times box. with that film. And quoting it. You had a lot of good times with that box. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I just think of all the like the the humour of my youth, filled by the quotes of Anchorman. I, I cannot neglect that. I would have to say film. Uh, there are plenty of other sex rave songs that permeated my youth that I could discard. Afternoon Delight. Because that's how I function with this uh, question. I have to think of what I would uh, prefer to be whipped away from my memories. And I can do without the Starland vocal band. Because they had no other songs. Uh, they literally... Did but they didn't. <laughs> they they didn't. Did, but they didn't. Um, yeah, they 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 died soon afterwards. Not literally, but uh, you know, uh, emotionally. They died in a glass case of emotion. <laughs> yeah, that would have protected them. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you too. A sweeping victory for the movie, I think, just in the sense that I don't want to lose those high school memories of quoting all the time, even if it potentially has ruined the film now. <laughs> and uh, probably at parts of our teenage youth. <laughs> True. We never engaged on a meaningful level because this is all we did. Okay, so that brings an end to another episode of that song from that movie. Let us know on Twitter which one you think is better, the movie or the song. Um, Ben, what is our Twitter handle? At TSFTMPod. Thank you. So you can help the podcast in many ways. One of those ways is by sharing it on a random subreddit. But Alex, what random subreddit should they pick this week? Um... Ooh, I was going to say Tim Robbins, but who's the guy? Who, what's the singer from the band called, <laughs> Ben? Uh, what, what is his name? Bill Danoff. <laughs> yeah, the Bill Danoff subreddit. I'm sure it exists. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 100%. You can also help the podcast by sharing this with your friends. Tell them it's the best podcast you've ever listened to. Mm-hmm. And also get leave us a five-star review, buy our merch, or sign up to our Patreon. All the links are in the show notes. So all left now is to do some goodbyes. So it's goodbye from myself. Goodbye, and goodbye from Alex. Dorothy Mantooth is a saint! A saint! (laughs) You did well to find another quote we haven't mentioned. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's my favourite one. And goodbye from Ben. I immediately regret this decision. (laughs) So, goodbye everybody. Stay classy, San Diego! Question mark? I don't think... Yes, so, basically... Whoa. That was loud. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, because I like to say that, and then my throat, like, creaked. <laughs> 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 Is that a sound of dying giraffe? <laughs>